Yeah, yeah, yeah. I draw it. I draw it. Maybe, just scientists. We bought this tools last year to our library. Uh, this is a new one. Ah, uh, all this. Just last, just last, last, and before you want to watch. Pessoal, todo mundo ouve? Precisa de um microfone? É, eu acho que você usa o que você vai ouvir bastante. Bom dia, bom dia, bom dia. Yes. So, um, just like I make a salvation in Portuguese, then we go to an English, right? So, bom dia a todos, sejam todos bem-vindos. Eu vou proceder depois com inglês para facilitar também para todos nós nos compreendermos. Como eu sei que tem um monte de que conhece bem inglês, então fique tranquilo, tá? Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Chris, for being with us. I don't know if you know, but it's a huge honor to have you here with us. Uh, we are so delighted to have you here. Uh, so first of all, thank you for you. Uh, I know the trip is not the best one, but maybe um, the, the view is good. So maybe this is, is a reward for this trip, right? So thank you, Professor Chris, uh, Professor Ballet, for making this possible. Thank you, uh, Marco, for being with us. We have many joint projects, so thank you. Uh, these students from the high school, I know that this is a good opportunity to speak in English, and to me, a huge applause for a big one, like Professor Chris. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Alfonso and Professor Felipe for making this possible. Uh, thank you, the students, the professor of the department. And so we're going to start right now. Uh, here we have the counselor, Professor. Uh, Sorry, Felipe Guerrero Maia, we have Professor Dalei, who is the Federal University of Santa Catalina, we have Professor Chris, then I will introduce him, uh, and the rector, the rector of the university. This is very special because uh, maybe following uh, the message from Plato, here we have a philosopher who is the rector of the university. So this is a, a strange thing, but this is maybe following the Pato message, right? So I will give the, the, the word to Professor um, Jelson to make uh, some some new um, his part, right? Okay. Good morning to everybody. Professor Crisp, it's a pleasure to receive you here in our university. Professor Nale, nice to meet you again. Chancellor Felipe Gregomayer, Professor Ex Rector, <laughs> Professor Evaldo, Professor Lucas, and other professors, colleagues, and students from the College of San Jose. Welcome. And our, and our uh, director, principal, Professor uh, Vanderlei. It's important to make uh, this, this event. Uh, Professor Chris, we are a community university, non-profit university, and we was born in 1977, 67, uh, for develop our region through knowledge. And when we make this event, this kind of event, we are we are, in fact, uh, um, fulfilled our mission, our mission. Uh, welcome to our university. I wish you a good conference, a good, uh, how can I say, stagia in English? Stay. 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 Stay here in our city, in our university. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Lucas, for organizing this event. It's very important. Uh, 
I think that our founders are very happy because it's not not it's not common to receive an important professor from Oxford. Yesterday we, we received in our university the ambassador from Italy. And now today we have a professor from Oxford. The internationalization is a target and we are uh, we are uh, developing this. Thank you and good conference for us. And I could say that maybe this is one of the most important moments of our department. It was sweet. The lady was a professor here years ago. Uh, but maybe you can say this is a very good moment in our department, maybe for the university. Okay. So just a quick uh, reading of curriculum, Professor uh, Chris. Maybe you can know much more than, than his publications, articles, books in his website on Oxford University, so you can follow and then try to say something. But I will try to say a few words about his uh, career. Uh, so Professor Chris uh, is a fellow and a tutor in philosophy at St. Ains College, Oxford. He holds the university position of Professor of Moral Philosophy, philosophy and, and the you hear fellow and a tutor in philosophy. Professor Chris's most significant work is Reason and the Good, which is the one that we bought last year, so this is a new book, so maybe Professor Chris can sign it. Uh, so this is the, his book, uh, in which he advanced some novel approach to the oldest questions in ethics. Uh, the central thesis of his work is that the fundamental issue of the normative ethics is what ultimate reasons might underlie our actions. Other major Orgs include a translation of Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics, and Rutledge Guidebook to Build on Utilitarianism, which is this one. Okay. And the only one, he was also editor of the Oxford Handbook of the History of Ethics, which is this big masterpiece. Right? Um, so, no formalities. Thank you again, Professor Chris, to be with us. Uh, so, no more words. The, the title of the conference is Reductionist, which is this one, and What Matters in Survival. So, Professor Chris, once again, thank you, and the stage is yours. Yeah, yeah, you can seat. take a seat, please. Yeah. Uh, Counselor Renamaya and Professor. Is yeah. it working? Yeah, it's working, but if you prefer this one. Okay, okay. So good morning everyone. Just to say that I'm here to mediate, let's say, the presentation. I did a translation of the PowerPoint, is that so you can follow people who doesn't understand well English and read here. And uh, I'm going to to be here in case you have questions, I can translate to Professor Roger, and if Roger wants me to also explain a little bit some things, I have not only the PowerPoint, he's going to follow the PowerPoint, but he has also a draft of a paper. I read the paper, so I hope to, to be able to help a little bit here, okay? I would like to, in the name of the Bilges Fund, the project, Bioethics, uh, distributive justice and pandemics to say thank you, Roger, for being here in Brazil, Porto Alegre, and Caxias do Sul, and tomorrow to Anopolis. So it's a busy journey, journey but uh, it's really a pleasure. I think that uh, Lucas' introduction says everything I don't need to add, uh, and the, the talk will show and uh, speaks for yourself. Okay? Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Dale. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Um, if I start backing away from the microphone, raise your hand and I'll return to it. So, uh, thank you very much to you all for being here. It's a great honour uh, and a pleasure. Uh, and I would like to thank the Chancellor and his colleagues for that very warm uh, welcome. 
Um, so my, uh, the title of my talk is Reductionism and What Matters in uh, Survival. And I suppose the word reductionism is a technical term and it might worry those of you who haven't come across it before. Don't worry, because the, the issue that I want to talk about is, in a sense, quite a simple one. And it is an issue that we all think about all the time. At least uh, most of us do. Uh, and it's our future. So we all have, each of us has a future. Um, and what that when we think about our future, we think about what might be good or bad in it. In particular, we would probably think about what might be good or bad in that future for us. So we need, we need to be able to answer two questions if we're going to think correctly about our future. One is, what am I? What makes me, me, and in particular, what makes me the same me, the same person, over time? Because if you can't answer that question, then you can't really think about your future, because you don't know who you are. So that's the first question. And the second question is, what is the correct view of what's good or bad? for people in general, and in, in particular, good or bad for me. So you have to be able to answer that question as well, otherwise you can't think about what matters to you in your survival, that is, in, in your continuing into the future. So uh, that, that was the, the, uh, the background. Um, So don't 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 read that yet. Um, <laughs> um, at the moment, I'm still on slide one. My time for trying to explain the topic of the talk. Now, Dale, do you want to say anything so far? Uh, to translate this? Yes. No, 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 it's not okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So. Now you might be thinking, okay, but what is reductionism? So reductionism is just, in a way, I, you know, I wish I'd avoided that term because it's just a piece of philosophical jargon. But the view that it's talking about is quite straightforward. So one view, which many people have held, is that what makes me the same person over time is that I have something like a soul, or an ego, or a self. And I'm identical with that, so if that soul, or that ego, or that self continues, then I continue. That, I, would, I suppose, in, in the West, was the standard view until the 18th century. And it's not the standard view now. So most philosophers have different view. And they have this view because of certain uh, thought experiments or puzzles that were developed by philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume. So here, here is, here's one of them. It's a bit gruesome, this example, but uh, bear with me, so that's a sort of trigger warning. <laughs> Imagine that you have an identical twin. Okay, maybe some of you do, but uh, if you don't, imagine you have an identical twin. You and your twin are travelling along in a car, and there's an accident, there's a very bad accident, and your, your body is horribly damaged beyond repair, but your brain is okay. 
Unfortunately, your twin uh, no longer really has a brain that will work. Something's, you know, the, the shock of the accident has damaged their brain over there. But their body is fine. Okay, so if you've got the situation, your, your brain is okay, your body's not, your twin's brain is not okay, but the body is okay. That's the situation. And it just so happens that a brilliant neurosurgeon is passing in their car, and they realize that they could take your brain, they could take you to a nearby, take both of you to a nearby hospital, and they could take your brain out of your mangled body and put it in the body of your twin. And everything would work. Okay? So, um, many people, when they think of it, and you know, and, and you, you know, the, the, as it were, this individual wakes up and they, they found out what's happened. And then there's a question which would be what, which of the sort of two people that did exist with the, with the single person now think that they were? And many people think uh, they would think they were the individual that had the brain. Right? And the reason they think that is because they, uh, at least many of them think this, is because that brain has all the memories, all the beliefs, all the character traits and dispositions uh, that the individual with the okay brain had before the accident. And this is, so this has got, has got the name reductionism because the idea is we're no longer talking about uh, an ego or a self or a soul. We, we've reduced all that language and we're just talking about connections of experiences over time. Okay, so in other words, on this view, which the majority of professional philosophers uh, in, in the world now believe, uh, it's sometimes called the psychological view or a Humean view because it owes a lot to Hume. The idea is that what makes us the same individual over time is the connection or the connectedness between the experiences that we have. So that's, that's reduction. Shall I go on to that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so that was, that was my first gruesome case. Uh, my second one uh, owes um, its origin to a very great philosopher who sadly died in 2017, Derek Parker, uh, whom many people think was the most important moral philosopher in the 20th century. Um, and this he calls the case of my division. Okay, so think about your the reaction you had to my first case. Now think about my division. This is what happened in my division. My body is fatally injured, as are the brains of my two brothers. My brain is divided, and each half is successfully transplanted into the body of one of my brothers. Each of the resulting people believes that he is me, seems to remember living my life, has my character and is, as in, and is in every other way psychologically continuous with me. And he has a body that is very like mine. So in this case, the brain has been split into two and put into two, two new bodies, bodies that it wasn't in before. So it's like the, you could describe the existence of this I don't know whether it's called a person um, or people. It's like a why. So everything is going along fine. Then the division occurs, and it looks like you have two people after the operation. And then you might ask, well, which of the two is the person who was there before? It would just seem arbitrary to say, oh, it's this one. Or this one. 
And for that reason, uh, part of it says that it, 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 this obsession that philosophers have had with identity, what makes the same person over time, is a mistake. We just have to talk about survival. So that's the reason um, that he talks about survival, and now lots of people talk about survival rather than identity. And my um, talk is really going to be a response to the My Division case, which is a bit different from the one that Parker gives, and it's a bit strange, but it seems to me not, not as implausible as you might um, think. Okay, shall we go on to the next slide? Yeah, Lucas, please. Yeah. It's Lucas. Question. Okay. Can I just add your um, observation? My division is it's very plausible because many years ago people uh, did lobotomy, divided uh, for some kind of disease, mental disease, and some tests uh, show that, for instance, a person with a task writing something with their uh, left hand uh, had some kind of memory that doing a task in the right hand seems to show that was a different person, didn't remember. So, so Byfield mentions this, this kind of thing. So it's not an implausible. My division is something that can really happen and maybe give rise to, to new egos, let's say, something like that. Yeah? So, sorry. Now, just to make it plausible, the strange uh, case in my division. Sorry. Yeah. Um, good, thank you. So, <clears throat> Parfit uses another piece of uh, philosophical jargon, which he calls relation R. Okay. Relation R is quite straightforward. It's whatever relation you need between your experiences over time for you to survive. What is it for your experiences to be connected and for them to be continuous? Um, and I've already mentioned having the same beliefs over time. Um, Parfit also talks about intentions. So you might intend to do something at a certain time, and then later you have the experience of doing it. That's a connection. Um, wishes, which are then fulfilled. Desires. All these psychological characteristics which occur over time. That's what relation arm consists in, this uh, idea of connectedness. And as I said, when you're thinking about your future, you need to have a view about what you, you are, but you also have to have a view about what's good or bad for you. And when you distinguish those two questions, you can see Im immediately that mere survival, the mere fact that you are going to be around in the future, is neither good nor bad in itself. You might think it is, but that's because you're thinking that there's something good in that life. If there's nothing good in the life, then it's not good for you. It could even be bad. If the, if the life is over or bad, then it's bad for you to survive. So that's something to hang on to. Survival in itself is neither good nor bad. It just provides an opportunity for goodness. You have to have something good in your life. And that brings up the other question that I mentioned about which theory of good, goodness for you, is correct. And there are essentially three that people talk about in contemporary philosophy. One is hedonism. All that matters is pleasure and pain. So you want pleasure and you want to avoid pain. The second view, is what some people call the desire theory, or the preference theory, which says what's good for you is that your desires or your preferences are satisfied. And that's the kind of view you find in welfare economics. And then the third view, people call the list view, or the objective list view. And this says, well, pleasure, yes, pleasure is good, but other things are good as well, for example, accomplishment, accomplishing something with your life, uh, friendship or personal relationships with other people, understanding the world, 
and you can add whatever you like to the to the list. So those are the different theories. And what matters in your survival is going to depend on the correct theory of who you are, but also on which of those theories or some other theory is um, correct. <coughs> So I've identified here three questions. What is the uh, what is the R uh, relation and how does it work? When we're thinking about um, the future, for what is that future going to be good or bad? Or for whom? That's particularly a, a difficult question in the case of my division. Because you might say now, um, well, We've now got two people that these futures could be good for. But Parfit has the reaction which many people have. He says, my division is twice as good as ordinary survival. So you remember the first case where the brain, the single brain, goes into the goes into the body of some, some other individual. <laughs> Parfit would say, that's fine, that's you know, it's almost like the life has continued. Um, in my division, the brain gets split, so there are now two lives. And Martin says, well, that's twice as good, because you're, you're now, as it were, having two lives. But then, then we want to ask the question, well, for what or for who is that whole life good for that future? And Martin himself does not really address that. Uh, and it seems to me um, he, he really should have done. And then I also want to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to concentrate really on hedonism for a reason which you'll um, see in a moment um, for the first part of the talk. But that doesn't matter too much because most people believe that pleasure is good and pain is bad. The desire, the desire theorists agree because most people desire pleasure and the absence of pain. And then most list theorists will have pleasure on their, on their list. But I will say a little bit about um, the different answers that you get when you're asking about what matters in your uh, future, depending on which view of world being or what's good for you that you have. Okay, so can we have the next slide? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's good, it's that. Um, <clears throat> read my mind. Um, so I, I, I said that what matters in your survival is who you are and um, what, you know, what's good or bad for people in general, particularly for you. And Parfit, I think, sees this uh, fact that these two things matter. And on, the, on his view, and the view which many people have now, um, either of these things could be relevant to what matters in your future. Because you might think, first of all, if the, a future person is less you, because, for example, there's less psychological connectedness, between your experiences, you have a reason to be less concerned about their, the, the, the future of that individual to the degree that you're less connected with them. But the more good there is in that life, um, the stronger your reason to be concerned about have, being connected with them. And these two things can come apart to a certain extent. So that's what's happening in this case of um, what Parfit calls fusion, which is another sort of weird case where two brains get pushed, pushed together. So a single individual becomes one. So it's different from my division. It's my division is like that. Fusion is like that. Um, so he's thinking about um, what, what, was, what happened in the case of uh, fusion. And this uh, quotation from Park, which shows that he recognises uh, that it's not just the degree of connectedness that matters, but what you get in the life. 
So in this particular case, you're, um, you're going to lose five features of your life at present that um, you, you don't like. So untidiness, laziness, fear of flying, nicotine, nicotine addiction, and the memories of the life, which are, has been really bad so far. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of possible downside there in that there's less psychological connectedness, but because the five features have gone, that's good. And that raises the question, well, how is part of thinking about, and how are most people thinking about, degree of connectedness into, in relation to value? And that does take us to the next slide. And the way, the way people think about it is like this. They think about it in, uh, in proportional terms. Okay, so imagine you're thinking about your future and you realise that in, say, 10 years, you're going to experience some very great pleasure. <laughs> right? You've been promised some trip of a lifetime or something. Trip to, to Brazil. You've always wanted to go to Brazil. And it's going to be fantastic. And let's let's say, let's just attach a number to that, the value. Let's say whatever, however you measure value, let's say that's got a value of 10. That trip to Brazil, 10 in 10 years' time. So it's worth 10 units of value. Then you start thinking about relation R. And for whatever reason, you, you, you maybe maybe you're maybe you've got some mental condition like dementia, you know, which is leading to a lack of connection between the different parts of your life. And you realise that actually, in ten years, you now will be only fifty percent connected to the individual who goes to Brazil. According to the standard view, the proportional view. That trip is now only worth five. Because you're kind of, only half of you is going to be there. You see what I mean? That, that's, that's the um, standard view. But what I want to suggest is that that standard view, though it does seem to be uh, very plausible to people, um, so for example, Parker talks about people who start smoking when they're young. As many of you will do. Um, usually we'll say to somebody who started smoking when they're young, you shouldn't do that because when you're old, you'll be terribly ill. And the young person might say, well, you know, that old person is going to be very weakly connected to me now. You know, they'll barely be able to remember what's going on in my life now. So that's like somebody else. So I'm just going to keep smoking. Half it says that could be correct. Right? And I, I want to suggest that no. Um, and here, here's why. So I need the next slide. The next slide looks a bit terrifying because it's got lots of uh, text on it. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I must apologize to Dalek because he had to translate this. And when I've given this talk uh, before, I've sometimes read out the whole of this slide. It's a quotation from Parfit, in which he uses an example from Bernard Williams. But my experience has told me that it's not a good idea to read out this slide. So I'm, going, I'm just going to, if you want to read the whole thing in detail, you could look at Parfit's book, Reasons and Persons. Um, but I'll tell you basically what goes on. And I'm afraid it's a bit gruesome again. So this is um, another crazy neurosurgeon, <laughs> but this one, this one is less benevolent. You remember the other one was trying to be helpful. This one is 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 very nasty person, and they they capture you, and they say, um, <clears throat> "I'm sorry to have to say this, but I am going to kill you." So this the end of your life is coming up. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid that's not all. Before I kill you, I'm going to torture you. 
in the most agonizing way you can imagine for quite a long time. So this is rather disappointing news to have, and you're rather worried about it, very worried about it. Then the neurosurgeon says, well, there's some other things I'm going to do. First thing I'm going to do is to give you total amnesia. So all your memories um, will go. And all your beliefs will go as well. Um, they'll just disappear from your mind. So it's almost like the neurosurgeon is clearing your brain of all these things. So clearly, the, the, the individual after that is going, not going to be very well connected to the individual before the erasure of the beliefs. So it's important to notice connectedness is going down dramatically. The neurosurgeon then says, um, I'm then going to make you believe that you're Napoleon. Right, so you're going to have all the beliefs that Napoleon had, somehow a neurosurgeon's got hold of this. Um, and you're going to have some apparent memories of your great victories and the odd defeat. Um, so yeah, the, but this individual in the future will think of their um, Napoleon. And then the neurosurgeon says, I'm then going to give you all the character traits that Napoleon had. Now, people have different reactions to this case. But my, I think my reaction, and I would say it's the reaction that most people have, especially when the neurosurgeon says, you're, you're going to, I'm going to give you a taste of the torture before I start doing the... Um, the erasing of the beliefs and so on. So you'll know what it's like. The neurosurgeon says, you won't be thinking about the sorts of things Napoleon would have thought about. Everything that's really in your brain right now is, it will become disposition, really. Because you're just going to be focusing on this horrible torture that's going to happen. My, my response is that uh, to that case is not that the neurosurgeon is doing me now some kind of favour by cutting down the continuity and connectedness of my current experiences to my future experiences. I, I, I just think that doesn't matter at all, because what matters is I'm going to be tortured. That's going to be dominating my, my thinking at that time. And I think correctly, I think that's the right, um, that seems to me the rational response. And what, so what it shows is that this proportionality view that most people seem to hold is a mistake, right? Because the the person, the individual that's tortured, is very disconnected with the individual who's captured initially. But that doesn't matter. What matters is the survival of their capacity to experience pain. I mean, if the if the neurosurgeon also says, "Oh, and I'm going to get rid of your capacity to experience pain." That's going to improve uh, your future a lot. So I think what this shows is that the correct view um, maybe we should go to the next slide. I can't quite remember what's my <laughs> Would you like to have the English? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so I, I think there, so this, uh, there are some lessons for the reductionists from this case of Williams' example. One is that, that streams of consciousness are themselves a form of continuity in your life, and they're very important um, part aspect of, of relation art. And Parfit and Williams actually both uh, don't mention this, which seems to me very odd. I mean, for, I would say for everybody, really, it, it, what, what your conscious, uh, your stream of consciousness will be experiencing by the next now is really important. Whether it's very good or very bad or 
um, neutral. And I think the other the other main lesson is that we have to get rid of the proportionality view and go for what I'm calling the value based view. So what matters in your future is not the degree of connectedness that you have now with with individuals in the future. It's whether those future individuals have the capacity for well-being or not that you now have. Okay, so the idea in the in the Williams case is that um, we'll say you're the same person as the person who's tortured because your capacity for pleasure and pain has continued, and pleasure and pain are valuable or disvaluable. So that's really all that matters in that case. So those, those are the two um, lessons. And I now want to move on to that second question about for whom this future is good or bad. So think about the my division case. For whom, for whom is the future good or bad? We've, remember, we've got rid of proportionality, so we're not focusing on that too much. Um, good. So we're now on owners of well-being. So what the, the what some people call the Cartesian view of my division, the old view, the ego view, the self view, the soul view, says about my division. What happens in my division is you die on the standard view of the soul and two new individuals come into being. So, up until the split, there's one life, that life comes to an end, two new lives start. So there are two souls, there, or two egos. Most philosophers don't believe that now, they take the reductions view. But if, like Parfit, you think that my division is twice as good as ordinary survival, you have to think there's a single owner of well-being here. This this whole story, the why story, has to be good for a single being. And because we're very tempted, and half of us tempted, to say, well, really, in that story, there are three people. There's the person before the division, and then there are two people after. So there are like three people. We don't want to say that if we think that uh, survive that uh, Former survivors is twice as good. We don't want to say each of those people gets a bit of the well being. Um, that's like a bit like going back to the old fashioned view. You have to, we have to say that that whole thing is good for something. So I would call that the owner of the well being. And it's, it's, the, it's the set of those three individuals. So my answer to that question for who is the life good in the my division case is the set of the three. And that is, that's weird. It's a very peculiar view, um, but that's um, the view I want to defend. <clears throat> and it has one very odd implication, which uh, I suspect may have occurred to some of you already, which is after the split, the owner of the well-being will be benefiting the set when they're in different places. Right? So imagine after the split we have, uh, let's call them person A, person B. And person B is suffering a lot of pain. Person A would probably think, oh, I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> right? But that's a mistake on the correct view of um, what matters in survival. Because that, 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 what matters in terms of well-being belongs to the set. So our emotions are out of tune with the truth about uh, well-being. Um, and you may say, well, that is so, so crazy that this, this uh, view that I've been defending is unacceptable. And that, um, that's a very good point, but I, I, 
another view would be, you know, we, we need to try to move away from our, our natural emotional responses, which are very much based on cases um, of no, you know, normal survival. You know, maybe, maybe we need to, to modify our, our, um, our emotions by thinking, for example, well, <clears throat> um, we don't think there's anything odd about a single person accruing um, or gaining well-being in their life at different times. So why should we think it's so bad about so implausible that the owner of well-being could um, gain well-being or lose well-being when there are people in different places? Space and time could be treated analogously. And Market actually has an example when he thinks a little bit like this, which he calls my physics exam. So in, in my physics exam, the, the story is, you're doing an exam in physics, and it's all going very well. You think you're, you're going to get a high mark. And then you notice you have two questions left to do, and you thought you had only one. So you think, oh no, I'm going to do really badly, because I can do only one question, and I'm going to get a low mark. But then you remember you have this amazing capacity to split your consciousness. So um, what you do is you split your consciousness, one side of your brain and maybe one of your hands <laughs> writes the answer to one of the questions, and then the other side writes the answer to the second question, and then you and then the two sides come together again. So it's weird, but it's conceivable. So Parfit says we can come to believe that a person's mental history need not be like a canal with only one channel, but could be like a river occasionally having separate streams. So this is the case of when it comes together. What I'm suggesting is we have to think about that analogy when we're thinking about my division. And what's going on in my division is yes, we are thinking of our lives as like a river, but rivers can split when they when they have deltas. So, you know, when rivers get near the sea, they split up and they don't join up again. That's the end. But we still say that the different parts of the delta are part of the same river. Right? So that's how we should be thinking of ourselves when we're thinking about our uh, future. Is there anything you want to say at this point, Dale? That's okay. I just uh, recommend that uh, students, high school students, don't take seriously this split of causing some examinations. So really, that's that's the main main idea I wanted to get across. That we should think of ourselves as rivers with deltas. Um, <clears throat> And the my division is, I, I think, probably fairly unlikely to happen to any of us. But the other thing I was trying to argue for was that what matters in our survival is that there's a series of experiences. If there's no series of experiences connected with you now, that's it. Your life is over. If there is, what matters is not the degree of connectedness that you have with the future members of that series, i.e. yourself in the future. That's not what matters. What matters is that the, um, the elements in your consciousness now that uh, ground, that support your having a good life, continue. And it doesn't matter too much whether other bits disappear, like irrelevant memories. It doesn't matter at all. If, the, if what matters as far as what's good in your life is still there. So that, mean, that does mean that you need to get clear on what you think the goodness of the life consists in. So on the hedonist view, it's quite straightforward. All you care about is that your capacity for pleasure and pain continue, and that you get pleasure and you avoid pain. So that has uh, significance for cases which 
some of you may have already experienced in your own life. I've certainly experienced them in my life. So my mother got uh, quite bad dementia at the end of her life, so she died in 2017. And it's very common for uh, children or people who know um, people with dementia to say, oh, she's a completely different person. Which she was, by the end. She could remember very much of what had happened at all. And her character changed a bit and so on. But actually, uh, and I might have said that at the time, that she was a completely different person. But I don't really mean that. You know, she was actually always the same person. It was always my mother. And if I'd been asked to explain that philosophically, I'd have said, well, there's a connection here between her experiences over her whole life. And if she was suffering, as she did, that, that, that uh, made her life worse, the whole life worse. Because what had survived was her capacity for pleasure and pain. So if somebody says to you, oh, well, you don't need to worry about getting dementia because it won't be you, I think that's, that's a mistake. Because what you are is the set of connected experiences um, across your life. So that's the hedonist view. Um, right, now we have, I, I mentioned that there are three different views. There's hedonism, and there's a desire theory, and then there's a list theory. So I'm just going to end by briefly talking about those views, because they are, they have different implications. So desire theories, they, that is, they are the theory that they form um, a set of the theories according to which what matters is the satisfaction of your desires. So we've all already got an element here related to time. Okay, so according to the hedonists, you don't have to care about your past really. I mean, it's gone. You, you, at any point in your life, the truth about how well it's gone so far is set, so you just want to move on, look into the future, try to get the greatest balance of pleasure and pain in your life you can. If you think what matters is the satisfaction of your desires, that could be, uh, you could have a different view. <clears throat> so for example, imagine you develop the desire to be a very famous novelist. And so you read lots of novels, you, you write lots of drafts and so on, and eventually you write a novel and you think it's pretty good and you take it to a publisher and they publish it. Remember, all you want is to be a famous novelist. <clears throat> um, for some reason you realise that you, this is your one and only chance, you know, your creative capacities are just, they're just kind of worn out. You've written this book, here it is, what matters in your survival? Nothing, as far as your own uh, existence now is concerned. So if you're, if you're <coughs> killed in an accident, that doesn't matter. What matters is the success of your book. Let's say you're killed in an accident, um, but your, your book is just superb and everybody recognises it's great and you become very famous after your death. That's fulfilled your past desire. So it really boosted the value of your life. So there's a kind of intertemporal aspect in desire theories which you don't find in um, hedonism. And particularly um, with I desires, desires about me. So you, you might uh, so you, you might, for example, think, I strongly desire that um, Iran does not attack Israel. And you might just have that very strong desire, which I have to say I do have. That doesn't mention me. Right? So whether that desire is fulfilled or not is, doesn't um, depend on, on me. Whereas many of the desires we have are I desires, the desire that I do something. 
And sometimes I have to be there to satisfy the desire. That wasn't true in the novel case, but it could be true in another case. And this case is, um, I call it my division star. It's like the uh, original my division case, except we're now thinking about it in terms of uh, desire theories. It turns out they have the same implications, really, as the Dominic theories, and the same will be true of objectivist theories. Okay, so some of you may know, uh, maybe you can see the um, wonderful painting by uh, Vermeer called The Lace Maker. And you might have been to Santiago to Compostela and touched the you know, that, that Santiago de Compostela was the church at the end of the um, pilgrimage to Santiago. So there are these pilgrimage routes and they all go to Santiago. <laughs> and then all the pilgrims over the last, I don't know, a thousand years or something, have touched the, um, the pillar in the church of St. James. And the pillar is all worn out. And it's a great experience. Um, so say you develop a strong desire to see the lace maker and to touch the column of St. James. Um, so imagine I've done that. I'm terminally ill and I have time to fulfill only one of these desires. Then my brain is fatally injured as are the brains of my two brothers. So I think you know what's going to happen. My brain is divided and each half is successfully transplanted into the body of my brothers. Each of the results in people is told that each of them has only the same amount of time left as the person before the operation. One of them visits the Louvre, the other Santiago. Okay. On reduction, on the most plausible view of reductionism, that's as good as the uh, period you have left being doubled. Okay, so they could you can imagine a future where you the operation doesn't happen and you do get to see. You go to the loo, and then you move on to Santiago. Great, you satisfy both desires. In this case, you, you satisfy both desires, but they're being satisfied at the same time by two people. But that's okay, because that's what matters in your survival. And it's the same with the objective list uh, theory. So this, this case is even more weird. Again, I'm not going to, um, to read it out, but... Um, so this is another case where, where uh, I want to write uh, a great novel. So I, I, I've got some rather um, you know, uh, not, not detailed plans for this uh, novel. And I realise it's going to take me four years of hard work to complete it. I then get a serious brain disease, um, which is going to affect the different um, parts of my brain involved in the writing and you can now predict what's going to happen a neurosurgeon comes along and says well, look i can divide up your brain and put it into other bodies and there will then be five of five people um, unfortunately um the the brain that's going to be left in your uh body what you now have that won't really do very much but the other four bits of brain they're going to, you know, one, one bit's going to think about the plot, another bit's going to think about the characterization and so on. And then by the end of it, they will, and they'll meet, they'll have meetings. You can go, but you won't be able to contribute very much. Uh, but at the end of it, there'll be this great novel, and we'll see how it goes. And it, so this happens, and the novel is hugely successful, and it wins the Booker Prize, the top prize in the world for novels. And all five people are invited to the ceremony. Right. So uh, think about the one who had the, the individual who hasn't played any part in the production of the novel. How are they going to feel? We, we, if they're like us, they're going to be thinking, oh, this is really disappointing. You know, I wish I hadn't got that prejudice and I'd done all the work from the novel. Because now these four people, they're going to get all the credit and it's not fair. Uh, that would be the natural reaction. And that probably is how we feel, but it's a mistake. Should, that person should not be thinking about that. 
they should see themselves as part of the group and they should be proud of what the group has done. And if they say, well, I'm just a member of that group, um, that's in a way true. But it's not relevant because the owner of the well-being is the set. They have written that book. They all, they all deserve the credit for it. But again, you know, the truth, I think, requires us to um, change the way we feel about cases like this. And I would say the same is true with friendship, knowledge, and virtue, and other things on the list. I've been talking about accomplishment. But you know, if you're friends with somebody, um, and they split into two, you should remain friends with the pair. Right. So imagine that my division case, you, you really like somebody because they've got a great sense of humour, and they're really good at telling stories. Then they go through a my division case, and the individual on one branch has a sense of humour, and the individual on the other branch is really good at telling stories. They, that's your friend, that pair. So if you loved the person before, you should love the pair. So again, it's odd, but I'm playing with the truth. So to conclude, um, what I claim is that what matters in survival is the continuing existence of the series of experiences that constitute the person in question. And in particular, the elements of that series that underpins or constitutes well-being, what's good of, what's good for the person. That's the first thing. The second thing is that well-being is good for its owner, and according to reductionism, the owner is that set of people constituting an owner. And in most cases, um, the, you know, maybe in, in all cases that have actually occurred in the history of the world, um, the, I mean, there may be some exceptional cases that of the kind that um, to do with robotomies and so on that Dali mentioned, but in most cases, the, the, the set is going to be a set of one. But that it doesn't happen. We can imagine cases in which that's not, that's not true. And what I wanted to suggest finally was that this general account applies to all theories of well being. So, in other words, what matters in survival depends also <coughs> on which is the correct theory of well being, not only on whether reductionism is or isn't true. Thank you very much. Thank you, you, uh, Roger, for this excellent uh, talk. So we have now some time, section of questions and answers. If uh, someone wants to ask in Portuguese, I can translate to Roger, and also, if it's needed, I can translate to, to, to Portuguese answer. So, just to say in Portuguese, uh, nós temos uma sessão de perguntas agora e respostas, Se vocês quiserem fazer em português, eu traduzo para o Roger e, se for necessário, eu traduzo também a resposta. Bom, então, está à disposição para falar. Por favor. When we think about the future, I think that remember us about the evolution of technology. That technology many times have the urge to uh, the need to predict the future. We have GPS, drones, social medias, and others that collect data, and by that, the artificial intelligence is capable to make prediction about the future. These predictions will not be enough for human theory, maybe, but look important enough for many arms around the world to act by analyzing the, this data and predictions of the future. That helps them to act even before the enemy could have a chance to become an actual enemy. 
and maybe it could cause innocent lives. My question is, is it possible to really survive and have, have well-being if the experiences that form the individual are not free and natural, but in fact mani manipulated by the predictions of the future? That's possible uh, nowadays because of the technology. Thank you very much. That, that's a very interesting question and a very timely given the way that AI is uh, advancing at the moment. And I think it raises the general question of what we mean by connectedness and continuity of experiences over time. Um, and I have to confess, uh, I don't have a clear answer uh, on this. So, <clears throat> for example, if we go back to the that rather nasty case of the, um, um, the neuro, Williams' example, this crazy neurosurgeon who's going to talk to you, if they say, um, I'm going to take away your beliefs, your memories, your character traits, all I'm going to leave you is your capacity for pleasure and pain you're going to be very worried. If, but if they then say, um, at the end of doing that, I'm going to end that stream of consciousness at that point. So there'll be nothing going on in your brain. You might immediately think, well, it's not ideal, but at least I won't be getting the pain. Then the neurosurgeon says, yes, I'm going to end that stream of consciousness and then I'm going to start it again, maybe tomorrow. I'm not really sure how to think about that because, it, um, so for example, on certain Buddhist uh, views, th there is no self over time. There are just experiences happening at different times and different places. And it could be that, that that's correct, and that maybe it's a mistake to be thinking about the self over time. And the, in other words, what you should, if, you, if you insist on thinking about the self over time, what you should think about in my revised case is that, that's a, if anything, that's a different person. You know, why should I care about that consciousness when it's not connected with my current consciousness? I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. And that, that. So I think you've raised the possibility that through AI, we could um, find ourselves asking the question, well, this uh, AI which can now manipulate my brain could arrange my beliefs and my desires and my intentions in such a way that maybe there's a lot more pleasure than there would have been in, uh, if the manipulation hadn't happened. It just seems to me, um, it's, to me it's unclear whether if the manipulation is very great, I should care from my own point of view about what happens to that individual. So, yeah, I mean, thank you for raising that. I will try to think more about it. Thank you, Professor, for the great explanation. Thank you. Okay. Understood? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Michael, please. No? Uh, yes. Okay. Doesn't need the microphone, okay? Uh, or, or. Everybody? Yeah, are you, are you recording something? Or? No. If okay. you are not, no, no. I think okay. people will give you me. Uh, I don't I, I think we don't. Uh, Roger, wonderful, uh, wonderful conference and several issues to think about. Uh, as I talk to you, I, I'm giving a class to my students, some of them are here, uh, about well-being and about those issues. We are discuss. certainly we will discuss in the next weeks about your uh, conference. I, I have a, a question that is this. Uh, uh, maybe you are right, uh, that what matters for the person 
I will say the person before the division, my division, okay. What matters for the person before the division is the continued existence of those series of experience that constituted, I, I change it, constituted at least partially the per that person before the division and maybe for the others, individuals, that, that, that are continuing uh, this series of experience. So maybe uh, if I understood your point, you, your claim is this, isn't, this is what matters for all three or, at least, or, or the group, okay, constituted by those experience. Okay, but uh, I, I was wondering about the following problem. For example, responsibility. You didn't talk about responsibility, but suppose that the person before the vision committed some crime. Okay, uh, so there is a point about the persons after the vision are responsible for that. You say that because what matters is well-being, the series, the continu the continuity of well-being uh, is what matters for the group or them. This does not imply that the people after the vision are responsible for what happened before the vision or are. What do you think? That is an excellent question. There is um, there's an interesting paper on this uh, issue by somebody called Theron Thomas in Philosophical Review, which I recommend. Um, I, mean, my, 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 I think my view is a bit different from Theron's in the, and yours, in that I would say if we believe in deserving responsibility, then uh, it's the set which is, is responsible. Mm. So that would have the if you believe the people after. Yeah. So the, I think the implication would be, for example, that um, let's say if division hadn't happened you would deserve 10 years in prison. Mm. Okay. Then what we should do is put okay. each of the people on the branches in prison for five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that this... I, I understood, but yeah. I, I don't think this... I mean, I think... I, just, I don't think this is fair. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think this may be in a concept of moral responsibility, something like this, attributability. It's true, but this is not fair for the people that were born. Uh, well, yeah, it's not, yeah, actually. Or come to exist. Yeah, I mean, you might have the, you know, the non reductionist view that new people come to be at the time that you I think that's right. Uh, Lucas, yeah, we, uh, I have a question, but before uh, I have a question from Lucas, who is in Pennsylvania. So, he sent, ah, okay, he sent me a, a sorry, uh, it, someone is following because it's yeah, 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 uh, but it's for yes. foreign students, it's not open like for the students who is abroad of your program, yeah. Thank so, Lucas, how could uh, make that question? Uh, even if you agree with the critique of the reduction is based on the consideration that what matters in survival is the continuous existence of a series of experience that constitute a self-person question, couldn't we also admit that other components of subjective experience that can be considered valuable, such as integrity and personal fulfillment, could not compete with theories that place well-being as the fundamental value. This is a question. So the second question is, and therefore, wouldn't such theories that take into account the relationship between these values and proportional connectivity also provide an argumentative base for criticizing the importance of reductionism for survival with the same intensity since these values are also good, uh, between commas, for the selves that carry them? So this is already the question. Maybe I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. That, so that, I think that's a very good yeah. question. I think it's on the same lines, perhaps, as Marco's question. Um, and what it brings out is, again, the importance of getting clear on 
what one should care about in one's future. And I think Lewis is quite right that you might say, look, I don't just care about my own well-being, I care, for example, about my personal integrity. Or the, the, my natural, the level of natural human fulfilment in what I do or what I don't do, that kind of thing. Um, I think I think I think that probably it depends on how you articulate the view. But I think in many cases it, it, it the, the analysis I've divided would still work in the sense that you can look at each of the branches and see how much human fulfilment there is in each branch, for example, um, or moral integrity. If you have an objective list theory according to which, because you can add anything to an objective list, right? Then you could add to your list integrity in the sense of not splitting. You've got that kind of integrity. There's something undesirable about splitting, um, which on the face of it is not a crazy view. Um, then my division would be clearly bad. It'd be much better just to survive in a normal way. But it would depend on spelling out, I think, the, the background positions. But thank, thanks very much for that, Anders. Yeah. One more? No, no, After? No, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you yes. and then Lucas. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question. It's like a new situation that uh, you want to help me to understand. Suppose that a uh, neurosurgeon can come at any time and clear my brain. It like, can be tomorrow, can be in a month, can be when I leave the room in the corridor. So, in this case, how can I leave, suppose, this situation that at any time can come up to and clear my brain? So, what's really matter in this case? Like, what do you think about <laughs> It's a good. It's a good case. I, I think my my first piece of advice would probably be to try to get away from the neurosurgeon. Um, <laughs> if you can't do that, uh, then try not to think about it. it. It's it's an interesting case because it's a bit like it's a bit like the Williams example, except it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I think the I think the things to focus on might be similar to the things that. that that I was suggesting we focus on in Williams's example. Um, so, if I mean, we can imagine a case where your life now is very unhappy, overall unha unhappy for you, it's bad for you, perhaps because you have some traumatic memories of things that happened to you in the past, right? So, in that respect, the neurosurgeons erasing those memories would benefit you. But if, if you don't have uh, such memories, and in general, um, let's say you have certain projects in your life, like um, you know, learning to play chess or something, and you've gone quite a long way down that path, and you're really enjoying it, and you think it's a good thing to have done, then you, that, that that would be a reason to, to regret the, what the neurosurgeon does, unless maybe they replace um, that project with some other one. Right. So maybe they raise your interest in chess, they, any of the capacity you have to play chess, but they put in the you know, skill to play go. Right. But at a much higher level, that you can play chess. Again, maybe that they're benefiting you by doing that. So I think with the same issues, you know, what effect is the removal of the elements going to have? That, that's the thing to think about. As long as we're thinking about that, a set of experiences, you know, the, the, you know to, go, to go back to the question about AI, it could be that if the neurosurgeon really starts messing around with your Right. Then you'll say, well, 
there's, that's not a, that's not a series of experiences anymore. <coughs> it's it's a it, the series has come to an end, and there are new series coming into existence. Or something like that. Because I was thinking that the, after uh, the the series of clean, my brain doesn't matter for me because I don't know what will happen after. Well, yeah, but then it, 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 what, what about if the neurosurgeon who's going to erase your brain is then going to talk to you? That does, that's, yeah, my, people do differ on this. I think Williams and, Vernon Williams and Derek Parker, I think we said, once everything's been erased, it doesn't matter what happens to you. Whereas my response is it does matter, because I still think, that's like an example of my mother, you know, the, the the capacity for pleasure and pain is still there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lucas, please. Again, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, quick questions. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was wonderful. Uh, the first question is about uh, the last conclusion, I think, which is about uh, we, we cannot just discuss about uh, what matters to survival, but maybe if the well being is an important concept, we, we should. Uh, discuss what is the right theory or what is the right conception that we have about uh, you know, well-being. So I could just hear you something about this. What, what is the, the right theory that we do think is uh, we can connect with this approach? Uh, and the second question I think is um, maybe, maybe this goes in the same direction that you are trying to um, defend, which is Sometimes when I, uh, I think about myself, uh, it seems that very intuitive that sometimes we just say, oh, I, I, I have to blame myself for having did this right, something wrong, you know. Uh, so the idea that maybe there is many me's mm -hmm. at the same time. So I, I'm not split my, my, my brain. I'm a unified entity, so I'm just one. But I think about myself sometimes to just say, oh, this is not me, or this is something different from what I thought that I should be. So um, mm. I'm thinking this seems very uh, intuitive in our ordinary life, and maybe this goes in your direction, because I was thinking in the, in the case of uh, the, the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the Nobel Prize, Right, so if you we think that, oh, this is not these four guys are not me. But we have the same impression about a unified uh, entity like Lucas. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very intuitive that maybe we can just uh, transpose this in the, in the original case, like thinking about ourselves, like a uni uh, unified entity, and transpose these to your examples, like four guys split the, the brain or part of the brain. So I think that this goes in for your argument. I don't, I, I don't know if it, this is clear. But yeah, 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 yeah. But, okay, so th those were excellent questions. Um, and I, you, you, you asked me to say what I thought about it, um, about those things, so I'm happy to say that. So I think desire theories are deeply mistaken. Um, and they're an unusual, um, uh, yeah, they're rather unusual in the history of philosophy. I mean, they come along only since the end of the 19th century, and they come out of economics. And that's where they are mainly found now. And I think philosophers rightly are moving away from them because they recognize that there's nothing good about having your desire satisfied. If, if you don't, if, if your desires are not for anything good. In other words, desire theories get the relationship between desire and good the wrong way around. So those one, that's one. So I think the real debate in philosophy is the old debate, which goes back to, well, certainly back to Socrates and probably beyond that, is the debate between hedonism and the list theory. And this theory, which includes pleasure on it. Um, my, my own, yeah, I have thought about this. My own view is that hedonism is the more plausible view because it, for various reasons, but partly because it, it can explain why 
we think things like accomplishments are valuable. It's because we enjoy them. Yeah. And if we hated to kind of accomplishing things, we wouldn't think it was a probably wouldn't think it was good. So so that's that's me, but then you know um, I also have to admit that I'm a pyramidist skeptic. So if you were to disagree with me, I would think um, uh, officially I should suspend judgment on, on whether hedonism or the objectivist theory is correct. If I, if I think that you're a peer of mine, a distinct peer. Um, so that, that, that's, that's what I think on that question. And then you raised this very interesting issue about multiple personalities, which made me think a little bit about um, Harvard's split brain case, except the splitting is, um, is across time rather than at a time. And I don't know enough about the psychiatry of, of multiple personality disorder or schizophrenia, but I imagine it doesn't, the changes don't just sort of happen like that. If they did, it would be very, very weird. And we might well want to say that on reductionism, oh, that person has now died. A, a new individual has come into being. And maybe then another person will come into being who's very similar to the one who's now died, but it's not the same because there's no continuity there. Or you might, I would talk in more plausible cases, you'd say, no, there are continuities here of some kind. Some of the beliefs stay the same. Some of the dispositions stay the same. Some of the memories stay the same. So we've got a, a, we do have a series across the life. But the, the bits of that life, from the phenomenological point of view, differ radically from one another, but it's still a single series. I mean, you know, the, 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 I guess the truth is that before long, the question about what we are over time is going to take us into general metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, like, as you know, that's, that's, that's as contested as any other area of philosophy. Yeah. But you could say, let's stop thinking about all this stuff and just get the metaphysics straight and then come back. Uh, I was coming to about uh, connected about this. Could, uh, could you say that, considering your view that what matters is well being, so uh, sometimes it's better for a person to forget some things? For example, in this sense, uh, it's not psychological continuity that matters, but how well we are in this connection. For example, some people say, no, we have to forget some things, to let it for the past. This is the, the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. And in other words, if, if a very clever, if you have some very damaging mm -hmm. scarring memories, and a psychiatrist says to you, we now have a technique of just getting rid of those. We're just, mm -hmm. you know, we can make them go, and there'll be no side effects. You, you, you shouldn't be thinking to yourself, well, <laughs> I guess that's okay, but I'll be less connected to the individual in the future than I now am, because if I keep the memories, I'm still going to be, I'll be more connected. That's irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? because what matters is the series, and what goes on in the series. The degree of connection, uh, other things being equal of, between elements of the series doesn't matter, except in so far as it affects well-being. And in the case you've mentioned, mm. it's good to get rid of something, get rid of these memories. So that's, it's a bit like Parfit's case of fusion, where he gets rid of his fear of flying. Okay, that's all, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank especially Professor Vaudo, the director, for organizing this session and to have a ski. Uh, Professor Gerson also, it is an honor to have you here as a as chancellor, spend some time. Uh, he's from a philosophical background also, so it's good to have you here. And Roger, especially, many thanks. It was a very philosophical, rich talk. 
and also a very pleasant one. So thank you very much. Good luck, good luck for me. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Most people just.